I want you to go to the book of Ephesians, Ephesians chapter 3 and verse 12. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to talk to you today about three words, three things. And it's important to me that these, while being in some ways elementary, are still important for our everyday walk. Amen. So um, I want to talk to you about three things, access, boldness, and confidence. The ABCs, access, boldness, and confidence. So in Ephesians chapter 3, verse 12, the Bible says this, Ephesians 3 and 12, I, I, in whom we have boldness and access, access and boldness, boldness and access, and then he makes this statement, with confidence by the faith of him, in whom we have boldness, say boldness, boldness, say boldness, in whom we have boldness and access with confidence by the faith of him. God, give us ears to hear what you're saying in this hour. Lord, this is, we know, we're confident in this very thing that this is not an hour to play church or to play with spiritual things. It's not an hour for us to lose our focus because of where our nation is, because of where we are, because of the things that are coming our way. We just thank you for truth, Lord, and boldness to share that truth, a confidence to do it. Lord, in a day and in an hour when the, the others, the other side, evil has all boldness. Evil is not afraid to say what they believe. They're not afraid to stand up and be bold and claim things that are not truth. Lord, help us. Open our eyes. In fact, we pray what Ephesians chapter 1 says, and that is that the eyes of our understanding would be enlightened, that our eyes would be opened, that we would know what is the hope of your calling. And God, we thank you for it. And we believe for good things. We believe that there is a, a, a church that you are strengthening the backbone of a church to stand up lest we find ourselves in days ahead wishing we had stood up and said something, wishing we would have made a difference, wishing that we would have stood up for truth. In Jesus' name I pray. And everybody said, amen. I am probably the least doomsday kind of guy that you will ever meet. For those of you who've known me for many years, I really am a, a, a positive, optimistic kind of guy. But a few years ago, it occurred to me when I looked at that flag over there that if we didn't stand up for things that are truth and right, that there might be one day that these United States of America would not exist. Amen. So it's, it's not time for us. So today I want to talk to you, and a part of it is because of where we are in the scheme of things. And it seems that uh, I read Ephesians yesterday, and this just leapt out at me. I got up yesterday and had my devotion, and I saw this, and I said, that's, that's where I want to go. Uh, for today. I want to talk to you about access. Now, I've shared probably many times about access. He says here, uh, the, the Word says, in whom we have boldness and access. I want to start with access because I think access is a word that uh, maybe you don't think of often, but here's the deal. You may not have access to people who are in the highest offices, but you do have access to one who created it all. You have access, but I want to talk about it from the standpoint of what we have access, the access that you have in other things. For example, you have access to the throne of grace. You have access 
uh, you have access to the authority of God. You have access to the wisdom of God. You have access to miracles. You have access to the supernatural. You have access. So access is a super important word to me. Uh, you realize uh, when you uh, when you know who you have access to and maybe who wouldn't even take the time for you, right? Uh, you realize how important access is. And so access is just a way in. That's all it is. If you know the access code, and there's some things that are, I think they're access codes in the kingdom. One of those is what we just did a moment ago, and that is we access spiritual things by understanding truth and principles and then begin to step out in faith and do some things. For example, if you understand what praise does, when you just get a praise in your mouth, I'll never forget my praise. Amen? I will never forget my praise. My praise is powerful because if I praise him, I will raise him. If if I lift him up, he lifts me up. He's worthy of all of my praise. I have, but these are spiritual truths that if you don't begin to flow in them and function in them, you, you don't have the benefit of the access. So there's access codes, but there's a, a lot of codes in the kingdom. They're mysteries or secrets. Anytime you see the word secret in the New Testament, a lot of times it'll either say mystery or it's a secret. They're not secrets because he's keeping something from you. They're secrets because he's keeping them for you. And one of the secrets to the kingdom is thanksgiving and praise. One of the secrets to the kingdom that gives me access into what God has for me is understanding the, the, the things, the, how can I say, the tools that God has given me. And one of those things that causes us to have access, it's like a secret code. It's when I bow my head and I say, Father, in the name of Jesus, the name that is above every name, I have access because of that great name. I have access. Now, that's not important unless you realize that when we talk about the power of choosing life over death, when we talk about those things, you can either choose to access the life that he's given us in Christ, the God kind of life, the abundant life that he said he suffered, bled, and died for us to have. There's a life beyond just living in the natural and your heart beating. There is spiritual life that we have access to. And so I want you to understand how powerful this word is. If you are denied access to a thing, if how many of you have ever, I, I don't like to go down and take my debit card and get money out, but if you don't know the right code, you can't get what's already yours right? You, I know that's a simple analogy, but some of you don't understand. There are things that God has for you that if you don't understand what the code is, if you don't know how to access a thing, and most often we access what God has for us by the faith of him. Now, I want you to understand it didn't say by my faith. I don't have time to go back and preach, but the Bible here says, uh, in whom we have boldness and access with confidence, by the faith of him, not by my faith. Now, that I don't have time to go back and preach it. I'm going to throw some scriptures at you really quickly. Galatians 2, 20 and 21 says that I'm not functioning in my faith anymore, but I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Go check it out. When I'm living now, I'm not living by my faith. I'm living by his faith. Now, all of a sudden, I'm not operating on my faith. I'm operating on the faith of him who gave himself for me. I'm operating in a God kind of faith. I've said it a lot of different ways here, but the reality is this, is that um, uh, Mark 11, for example, says, one, one version would say, have faith in God. Another version would say, have the God kind of faith. Have, Chad, you have the God kind of faith. You say, are there times that he will increase my faith? Absolutely. Everything you have in the kingdom comes on a line of faith. It's why I've been really hard lately on preaching faith, preaching faith. It's because if you don't understand and you're not, say it another way, skillful in your faith, 
Some people aren't skillful in their faith. They know a little bit about faith. They use a little faith occasionally, and sometimes they step out on faith, and they find themselves getting out of the boat, and they don't know what to do when they start to sink, like a Peter, for example. But when you take your eyes off of him, so I have a line of faith that I have to stay in all the time. I'm always in faith. If you see me, I'm in faith. If you see me in the morning, I'm in faith. If you see me in the afternoon, I'm in faith. If you see me at night when I don't feel good, I'm still in faith. So here's the thing. Some people are so moved by their feelings that they can't stay in faith. Amen? So if my feelings override my faith and I'm always always checking, I I said something the other day because it's a frustration to me. I said it while I was on the radio. We, We, as the people of God, we oftentimes, we check everything by, how does that make me feel? Well, how does that make me feel? Well, you know, I heard jo- Joyce Meyer say one time, you probably ought to stop asking yourself how, how that makes you feel. You know, it was one of the greatest revelations in my life is when he said, when, when I read the word and I realized, uh, I realized that, for example, in Joshua, He said, be strong and of a good courage. Be strong. Did he say, feel strong? No, he didn't say that. Yeah, but what if I don't feel strong? Stop thinking about the fact that you don't feel strong when he said, just be strong. God will never give you a directive to be strong and not give you the ability to be strong. And so here's what we've done in Christianity. We've made it all about well, how do I feel about that? Well, what if... <laughs> Nothing more than feelings. Whoa, 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 whoa. God, it, it is one of those things that just drives me crazy. It's because, say it another way, you have to get over yourself. If, if I want to walk in the Word and do what He says I can do and have what He says is already mine, I got to know the access code. I have some in, things that are my inheritance. I have some promises. I have some things that are already mine in Christ. He's already bought and paid for them. And somehow you believe they're just going to show up. The only way they're going to show up is along the line of faith. Thank you so much. Hallelujah. Amen. Now I can be a real preacher. Amen. Here we go. But you guys have heard me say this so many times. It, sometimes I feel like it falls on deaf ears. But if you spend a lot of your day and a lot of your time, and you've gotten in the habit of everything that comes your way, how does that make me feel? How does that make me feel? How does that make me feel? Stop asking yourself how that makes you feel. Well, what if my feelings are hurt? Well, it's I'm not asking you not to acknowledge. I'm just that that hurts your feelings. Yeah, but somebody said something that hurt my feelings. I I understand that. But what I'm saying to you is is I either have to do one or two things with that. Either got to forgive them and go on or hold it, which is not the thing to do, and just be bitter about it. Thank you, Howard. And, And just be bitter about it or, but if you'll just say, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stay in the Word. I'm going to stay in faith because everything comes along the line of faith and your feelings will follow. Now, I came up in, in the faith movement, but I was never a real student of these faith guys until recently I began to go back and listen to some of those faith sermons and I began to realize that some of those old faith dudes, some of those faith preachers had something to say. And uh, because everything we access is along the line of faith, I often thought, well, I just don't have enough faith for this or I don't have enough faith for that. But I'm telling you, the way, I'm going to get to the confidence part, the reason you don't think you have the faith to do a thing or you don't think you can face a thing is because you haven't had, uh, you haven't went through enough stuff using faith to figure out that it really works. Amen? 
It really does work. Confidence comes, and I'll get to confidence in a minute, but confidence comes when you've used it over and over and you realize, man, this really does work. Secondly, um, and I'll move on in a minute, but let me just say this. Faith is tied to something. Faith is tied to the Word. Worry is tied to fear. Amen? Worry is tied to fear. Say it another way. When you worry, you close the door to everything that God has for you. Um, there's, there's a long debate in Christianity as to whether or not worry is a sin. Let me just put it to you this way. If you see it as a sin, you will deal with it differently, right? If he said to us in Matthew chapter 6, take no thought for the morrow, people who are taking thought for tomorrow, what are they really doing? Oh, they're kind of worried. Yeah. Have I ever been worried? You better bet. I've walked around and said, what are we going to do? What are we going to do? Listen, once you realize that faith is that open door, that faith in this God, not faith in my faith, but faith in a great big God who knows how to get things done, faith in this awesome creator that knows what you need better than you know what you need, and he gives us access into all these things, but we can't get into worry. So what am I saying? I would personally advise you to deal with worry as a sin. Amen? Let's deal with it like what it is. And say it another way. Okay. If the word told, if God told you in his word to do something and you didn't do it, would that be disobedience? Well, he told you not to worry. <laughs> he told you not to worry. Amen? He, just, he said, don't worry. Stay in faith. Stay in faith. You have access, but all access comes by the things of faith. Begin to be skillful in your faith. But, you know, I said last week, sometimes, and I've done it many, many times, I've prayed for healing, needed healing in my body, and, and, I, and I do the same thing you do. I go, well, let me just check and see if my neck still hurts. I receive, I receive healing by faith, and I, why, if I have faith, if faith is a spirit thing, why am I checking my body to see if it works? Well, eventually it has to manifest itself when I quit hurting, right? But if the first thing you do when something comes your way is you pray the prayer of faith and then check to see how your flesh is doing, that might not be a good idea, right? Just probably not a good idea. In other words, what we receive, we receive by faith. It's important for you to be skillful in your faith. It's also important for you to realize that things come your way and you have an opportunity like I do almost every day to worry. Say it another way, to fret. Or I'm really spiritual and what I used to tell people all the time is, you know, I'm just really concerned about that. That's sometimes, that's my mask for, I'm worried about it, but I don't want to say that. Why is that important? It's important because sometimes we've been taught not to speak a thing, but we're turning it over in our mind. Any t if he says, take no thought, don't mean the thought won't be offered. If he says, take no thought, doesn't mean the thought won't be offered. How do I know I've taken the bait? Well, you took it and turned it over in your mind about a million times. You know how to know if you're worried about it or not? You don't think about it. You lay it down at an altar and you don't think about it. You just, and then you say, well, what if I pray for something and I'm still concerned? I'm greatly concerned, Brother Neil. Amen. I'm greatly concerned about things. You know what I do? Lord, I thank you that you're working in that situation. I thank you right now that you're moving in that situation. I thank you that angels are being dispersed on my behalf. I thank you, Lord. I give you praise that you know everything I need. I give you praise, oh Lord. So now I'm being skillful in my faith and I'm learning. Um, let me say it another way. If, you, if somebody came Wanda, and knocked on your door one Saturday. You don't know them. You don't know who they are, what they're doing at your house, but they knock on your door. You don't open the door because you don't know them, and you say, hey, go away. I don't know you. And they keep knocking. 
and you go, well, I'm, I'm either going to try to run them off again or I'm about to call the law or do something. And they kept knocking. And you said, hey, you better go away. I've got a gun in here and I'm, I'm liable to use it. And they still kept knocking on the door. And you said, well, look, I'm going to call the police here in a minute if you don't go away. If they kept knocking, would you open the door? No. What if they knocked for 30 minutes? You have access into authority. Your authority is whether or not you're going to open that door and allow that thing in. He said, well, what if it comes every day, all day long? Until you learn to be skillful and keep the door closed. Amen? You have to learn to keep the door closed. Say it, say it the Elvis Presley way. Return to sender. Address unknown. They rolled upon it. Return to sender. I ain't opening the door for that mess, and you shouldn't either. Amen. Thank you, Pastor Howard. God bless you. Let's take up an offering for Pastor Howard. He's going to cheer me on. Can somebody say amen? amen? Just because I hear you knocking, I'm still saying you can't come in. You know what this is? That's really a simple way to talk about renewing your mind. This, this is learning. You, you know, here's what people don't know. All through the Word, Steve, the Bible says, lift up your head, O ye gate, and be ye lifted up, you everlasting door. That means your head is a gate and a door. Lift up your head, O ye gate, and be ye lifted up, ye everlasting door. And what's going to happen? The King of glory will come in. That means this right here is a gate and a door. And if you lift up your head and, and be lifted up, you everlasting door, you know what happens? The King of glory begins to come in. Hallelujah. Amen. The King of glory. So it really is about understanding that you have access into authority to say, uh-uh-uh, we're not going there. I'm not going to spend my time thinking, talking, worrying about all of that. I'm going to stay in faith. And this is what people have the question. You may ask this question sometime. Is faith enough? Is faith enough? Is faith in God alone enough? Well, let's start with salvation. Faith in the finished work of the cross of Calvary is enough to get you to heaven. When you receive Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior and you embrace the death, burial, and resurrection, it's enough to get you to heaven. But what happens is we get all twist up when people, that, that's going to get me to heaven, but it, will it get me through next week when the enemy says you're not going to be able to pay your mortgage when, when the enemy says, I've got your kids and you can't do nothing about it. When the enemy says, look at you, you've been a fool your whole life. Believe in that faith stuff and it ain't never worked for you. You keep on believing. You keep on trusting. Don't give in. You have authority to close that door. So you've got access into all kinds of things. You have access into miracles. You have access into the, the wisdom of God. You have access into the throne of grace. Probably the most important thing I'd cover this morning is, is that you have access into the throne of grace. You have access where you didn't have access. Now, that wasn't a big deal, Steve, until you realize that up until this point, until Jesus comes and the veil's rent in two, and when he goes to the cross and they say, and the veil was rent from top to bottom, now all of a sudden we have access to something that beforehand you always had to ask somebody to pray for you. You had to, you had to go to somebody to get to God. And that's when he said, now you have access. It's a shame that we don't use our access. It's a shame that you have things, you have treasures and inheritances that are yours. You just got to use the right access. Secondly, lest we run out of time, let me talk to you about boldness. Boldness is something that 
If depending on personality type, some people seem to come by it a little easier than others. Some people are bold. They, some people don't get bold till you make them mad. Amen. They don't, they, don't get mo, they don't get bold until you've knocked on the door for about 30 minutes. And then I'm going to come out saying, I don't know who you are and what you're doing here. But you better find you a car quick somewhere. If you knock on my door again, it's about to go down. It's on like Donkey Kong. Amen. So you get that way when you get to a certain point, but I want to talk specifically about a boldness to stand in the liberty where Christ has made you free. I want to talk about a boldness to share the truth. I'll relay a story to you. And Howard and I were in in the room one day, and I guess I've had an awareness for a, a, a few months now about truth and sharing truth and we had a mutual friend who had gotten himself into some sinful mess. And I know him well enough to have a conversation maybe, but because of the circumstance and because of the situation, I felt the need and I I said, well, I'll just go have a talk with this guy. Now, this guy is super wealthy. He's a man that is in a position of authority and power. But what he was doing or what I thought he was doing wasn't right. In fact, it was sinful. And it was, it was going to ruin a home. It was gonna, there was going to be some situations. And I said, I'm not going to sit back and just let this happen. I'm, I may make him mad. I may run him off. He may never give our ministry another dime. But I'm not going to sit back and let a home be ruined And I'm not going to sit back and not tell him the truth because you know what the most loving thing I could do to him is tell him the straight, honest truth. Look, now here's the thing. Some people have been raised in church and they think sharing truth means being rude. You, You can share truth and be as kind as you can be, but... But the reality is, and, and, and it ended up that I didn't have to do this particular thing, but I, I remember having a conversation with Pastor Howard, and I said, look, I'm not going to not tell this guy the truth. This is ruining a family. I'm going to go say the truth. I'm making an appointment. Somebody said, time out. Hold on. I think his pastor's already talked to him, or this pastor's already talked. Hold on. Because what I was thinking was, what if nobody in this city, in the city that I live in, what if nobody in this city has the grit, the gall, whatever you want to call it, to go sit face to face and say, look, home, I can't let you go. This is not going to go unchecked. I will answer to God and I'm going to tell you the truth. I'm going to hold you accountable. I love you, love you enough. I'm not going to go out and knee jerk. I love you enough to tell you the truth. Now, say that another way. I have to have boldness to share the word. In in uh, because we're running out of time, I'll take you through a few scriptures real quickly. But in Acts chapter four, verse thirteen, the Bible says this: Now, when they saw the boldness of Peter and John, and perceived that they were unlearned and ignorant men, they marvelled, and they took knowledge of them that they had been with Jesus. When they saw their boldness, they realized these men have been with Jesus. There's something that happens when you find a place of prayer and spend time with Him. You get much more bold to do what He's called you to do. Do you know, the the closer I get to Him, the more bold I am. The closer you get, when you spend time with Him, they clearly said, these men, they basically said, these ignorant fools, look at them. He said they're, they're unlearned and ignorant men. Do you know, if you spend, you don't have to, I, thank God for education, right? We're all about education. We believe education is a wonderful thing, but there's some things, there's an education that comes from being close to Jesus. There, there is wisdom and, and education that comes from being close to Him. And the more time I spend with Him, the more bold I become. The more bold I become in my calling, in my anointing, in what God's called me to do. You just, sometimes spending some time with Him just causes you to step out and be super bold for what He's called you to do. It goes on to say 
in Acts chapter 4, verse 29, same chapter, just a few verses down. I'm going to go to 31 after that, Shannon. But 29 says, And now, Lord, behold their threatenings, and grant thy servant that with all boldness we may speak the word. Now, let me say this. In the book of Acts, they were facing a lot of things. The early church, right? So it's the early church, and they're facing a lot of things that they're going to have to be bold about because of their situation. Newsflash. We are facing some situations in our nation and in the church that if we don't begin to be bold, have y'all not noticed that hell is bold about what they believe? Have y'all not noticed that the, the enemy's bold? You, you get on social media for five minutes and you figure out they are bold about what they believe. They ain't afraid that, look, it used to be, I think some of that stuff must have been done in the back corner. Now just turn on the Grammys. You can see it live and in person. They're bold about what they believe. They, they um, uh, I saw something the other day that one of the largest gatherings of, uh, of the satanic church hap was happening in Boston. And I don't know how long ago that was, but somebody had posted some stuff about it. I said, they're bold. They were up tearing pages out of a Bible, shouting, hail Satan, hail Satan, tearing the pages out of the word. And you think it's time to play and sit back and be, uh, act like Minnie Mouse? I'm telling you, let, let's say it another way, and this, this will really, really kind of stir you a little bit. If, if we, because I'm at that age too, Howard just told y'all they, they kept their grandbaby. If uh, Shannon Carey's got grandbabies, many of y'all have grandkids and great-grandkids. If you don't stand up and say the truth, your grandkids won't have a voice. Your kids and your grandkids. And, and I just want, but, but how you do that, not asking you to be rude. I'm not asking you to be anything. I'm not, this has nothing to do with any of that. I'm just asking you to be bold enough to stand up and say the truth. Just say, um, no, no, no. Uh, quick story, I promise, and I'll be. Christian told me he was talking to a friend of his the other day, and it's, it's a guy, he's been in our home, and Christian said he was talking to him, and the guy made a statement. Had, had something to do about his, his, his wife has a career. They, they lived in New York City for a while. Uh, she's a professional dancer by trade, been on national tours. She's danced on Broadway and all this stuff. And the guy made a statement. He said, well, when I married my wife, I didn't marry her career. And so in the boldness that only Christian could have, he said, oh, no, I strongly disagree with you about that. When you married her, you married her career, her future, her path. When you married, you married her family, you married whatever. Some, and he said, I just couldn't let that go by because if you don't call somebody, that's not, you and I know, I, I've been married long enough to know, I married her, I married her family, I married her kinfolk, she married my kinfolk. I mean, you, you, I didn't just marry Lori, I married the whole thing. And if some, But if somebody never calls you on that, if somebody never calls you out on what you believe is a lie and you can do it and be sweet about it, oh, no, no, I disagree with you about that. I disagree. I totally disagree. And you can keep smiling and say, like, I 100% disagree. Right? I totally disagree. But you got to be bold enough to do it. You got to be bold enough. You got to be bold enough to do it, right? Got to say, uh, my friend... <laughs> That's not truth. And you're about to ruin your marriage. <laughs> Amen? If you love people, you'll tell them the truth. If you love people, you'll tell them the truth. Amen? And then lastly, let's talk a little bit about, I'll take just a minute here on confidence. Because some of you are maybe confident in some ways about some things, but maybe less confident about others. A couple of things that come to mind. First of all, I'm more confident in the things of God and in the things of life that I've done more often. I'm more confident because I've seen God do certain things. I'm more confident in my faith. I'm more confident in my prayers. I'm more confident. And if you understand this little simple principle, you'll understand that um, if I've done something long enough, I, I can be really confident if I'm... If I'm uh, seeing victories. But I also want to warn you about God, uh, about the things of God,
because there have been too many times that I've lost my confidence in the God in me. I've lost my confidence in the my anointing, if you want to call it that. That's, that's a good charismatic word for you. But I've lost my confidence. In fact, Sarah might remember this. We went into a conference one time. We were in, I forget where we were. We were in one of those uh, camp meeting conferences and your dad called me out and prophesied to me about how the enemy had came and robbed me of my confidence in my calling. And boy, was he spot on. Robbed me of my confidence. See, when, when the enemy can come in and just absolutely, you're not confident in your prayers, you think, why should I even pray? What does it even matter? I don't think it's doing anything. No, he'll rob you of your confidence, right? So go with me to 1 Samuel chapter 17. 1 Samuel chapter 17. And I want to say that it's going to be somewhere down about verse 28 or so. You're going to know the story very well. 1 Samuel 17 is the story of David and Goliath. And one of the things that when you, when you look at this story, let's go to verse... Let's go to verse, we'll go to 28. Then Eliab, 1 Samuel 17, 28. Then Eliab, his eldest brother, heard when he spake unto the men, and Eliab's anger was kindled against him. What happened was, is David came down to feed these men. He was coming down to bless them and to bring food for them. And David was not thought of as a warrior. He probably shouldn't, he, he wanted to go down, but he probably shouldn't have been among them. They certainly didn't see him that way. Sometimes people don't see you in a way that you see yourself. And so David had some experience with these circumstances and he comes down and he's, he speaks and he says, Eliab, that's his older brother, his anger was kindled against David and he said, why comest thou hither? And why, where have you left those few sheep in the wilderness? I know your pride and the naughtiness of your heart. For you're come down that thou mightest see the battle. And David said, what have I now done? Is there not a cause? And he turned from toward another and he spake after the same manner. And the people answered him again after the former manner. And when and when the words were heard that David spake, they rehearsed them before Saul and he sent for him. Uh, break this down for you really quickly. He just basically said, look, is there not a cause? I hear this Philistine run in his mouth. And I, j I came down and I want to know, he wants to know two or three things. He wants to know, are y'all just going to let him talk that way? What are you doing? And so he says to them, here's what I'll do. I'll, I will, uh, I will uh, I'll go down and fight with him. And he, the first thing he wants to know is, is he says, is there, uh, what's the reward? Isn't it good to know what the reward is if you'll go into battle, right? So he says, here's what I'll do. I'll go into battle and just because I don't have time for all that, I'm trying to get you out, I promise. I have to go to a funeral this afternoon myself over in Rainsville. My dad passed away and they're having his graveside service a little later this afternoon. But bottom line is, uh, is that uh, what David says is, is he says, I was, I was in a fight with a lion and a bear. They came and took some sheep that I was watching. And because I've fought a lion and a bear, I have confidence to fight a Philistine. That's basically what he said. After you've been through a few wars, when you've been through a few battles, you begin to be more confident in, in what God's called you to do. Say it another way. He was in his calling. He was called to keep those sheep at the time. That was his calling. That was what his assignment was. He's keeping sheep and doing what he's supposed to be doing. And he, he learns a few things. You know, if you just sometimes stay in your calling and, or as one brother said, stay in your lane. 
David was just staying in his lane until he figured out, I can't stay in my lane anymore. And he goes down, his daddy sends him to go feed these guys. And he gets down there and he hears this uncircumcised Philistine saying all this nonsense. And he says, y'all don't know me. I slew a lion and a bear. He said, they came in and took one of these sheep and I chased him down and killed him. And this guy right here, he ain't going to be nothing for me. What are you saying? I'm saying once you've had the confidence to see what God has done, here's where I'm asking God to open your eyes. Some of you can look back over 30, 40, 50 years and all you see is all my life you have been faithful and all my life you have been so, so good. With every breath that I am able, I will sing of the goodness of God. I've been serving God a bunch of years now. September 23rd, 1985, I was born again and bap- surrendered, finally surrendered my life. I put it that way. Baptized in the Holy Spirit. God began to move in a certain way in my life. And from September the 23rd of 1985 until now, the only thing I can tell you is, is, and I'm 57 now, all my life you have been faithful. When I look back over all of those years, when I look back over everything God's done for me, I'm not going to worry about making a payment here or there. I'm not going to worry I used to pray worried prayers. I used to not have a lot of confidence. But when I look back, I will sing of the goodness of God. Because all my life, you have been faithful. Yeah, he's been faithful. All my life, you have been so, so good. Yes, he has. He's been so good to me. And look, there's very few times that I'll tell you to look back because I like to look forward, see what God has for us. But some of you sitting here today, when you look back over 30, 40, 50, 60 years of knowing that God has been faithful, he's been so faithful. So my confidence comes... I have access, I have boldness, and I have confidence. My confidence comes from knowing what he's done. Looking back over my life and seeing where he's come through time after time after time. When I, when I, when I thought there was no way, when I, well, this, I guess this is it. I'm just telling you, look back. Here's what I'm asking your eyes to be open to because... Sometimes, you know, we talk about that spirit that comes, I've even preached on it before, that the God of this world will blind the minds. You know what I think he does to believers? He blinds the minds of those who don't know Christ from seeing their need for a Savior. But you know what he does to believers? He blinds their minds from being able to look back and say, all my life you have been faithful. Because every time I look back, I see his faithfulness. Now, you can choose to see whatever. Have, have you not ever had a few days that you had to cry and wonder if it, is God being faithful to me in that? Absolutely. The old timer Anita used to sing, I had to cry sometime. Right? But he's been faithful. Tough nights, long nights, hard battles. But here's what I say. Every time I look back, all my life, you have been faithful. And all my life, you have been so, so good. With every breath that I am able, I will sing of the goodness of God because I choose to see the faithfulness. It's, it's almost like 
when you look back over your life, if you served him as long and seen his goodness so many times, it's almost like he's going, see what I did? Look back here. I'm going to do it again. I'm going to do it again. I'm going to do it again. <laughs> you just got to be able to see the right way. You got to look back over your life and see the goodness of God. And it, here's what it'll do. It'll give you boldness and confidence to move forward into what he has for you. It's, it all just, it's just going to depend on you. That's a faith decision, by the way. That's a faith decision. Well, I guess you just ain't, you just probably ain't had the kind of tragedy we've had. Ah, <laughs> uh, yeah. Yeah, but you know, you know why I laugh? Because I've learned to count it all joy. I've learned, you don't know how to faith count. Faith people count it all joy. Why? Because we've learned to laugh at every scheme of hell that came to destroy me, everything the enemy brought my way. All my life, you have been so, so good. With every breath that I am able. As you're standing on your feet. Of the goodness of God. Ah, oh, we thank you. I killed a lion, ripped his head off. I killed a bear. Ah, uh, this big old ugly thing ain't going to be nothing. He may laugh at you because that's what the enemy does. He's a big old ugly Goliath. But giants really do die. Yes, they do. You just got to stay in. Learn, be skillful at faith. Some people, you have faith. You just ain't learned to be. Sharpen your faith sword. Come on. Let iron sharpen iron this morning. Thank you, Lord. Would you just, one time as we close, would you just sing, All my life you have been faithful. And all my life you have been so, so good. Every breath that I am able, I will sing of the goodness of God.